Blah. <laughs> I spent 20 years doing Empire Hideous. And right. I, I never really got to that plateau with the band mm -hmm. that I wanted to. And, uh, and it was just a constant revolving door of musicians coming in and out. Mostly it was bass players, but, uh, there was, oh, or even a second guitarist. And it was always an issue. So, you know, because then you got to teach them, you got to teach right. them how to play. And, and it takes months. It doesn't, it's, you know, yeah. for us, we used, Chemistry. To rehearse, we used to rehearse three days a week for about three hours a night. And if I wasn't rehearsing, I was at the studio writing music jamming music I, I we had another band that used to, to to used to share the studio with us i used to jam with the the guitar player who used to also fill in on on guitar for empire hideous so this just went on for for a very long time you know we, i was trying to keep it tight but when you lose a bass player or a, a rhythm guitarist and you get somebody new you got to go through this whole training period where they learn every accent of yep. the instrument that they're playing of the song yep. that they're playing on their instrument Yep, and I I just couldn't keep it together. You know, if you can't keep to keep a band together for three years, you might as well quit because it's just it's pointless. It really is because you know you just got to keep teaching people over and over and over, and then they come in and then they go out, and then you got to start all over again. It's ridiculous. Let Let me interject here for one second. I, I'm curious to know. Talk talk to me a little bit, or if you could explain for say uh, those who are not musicians, the 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 chemistry in a band. And the dynamics of a band, and if you change a member, how does that change dynamics and chemistry, and what does that do to everything? If you could talk a little bit about that, sure. Well, I I can give you some prime examples. When I when I first started the band, and we were nobody, uh, it took about let's see, um, eight, nine, nine. It took about uh, us till about from 1988 to 1994, 95. In 94, 95, the band began to really climb the ladder, and like we were getting a lot of shows in New York. A lot of people started to like really dig the band. We we're opening with other bands or and playing bigger shows, um, and that's when we we really started to get more notoriety. But before that, from the early days on like i'll never forget the first lineup i had my whole my whole idea was to create a band record an album and continue to play and right. it, it and it began to snowball for me and i really got into it um and then there was a certain point in fact that in, in 19 i believe it was 1989 88 when i had uh Oh, was it 89 and 80? I can't even remember. About 88, 89, I had some serious uh, health issues. And I, right. I, I decided that I was going to put all my focus into being a musician because I, I, as an artist, I wanted a new outlet. So rather than using the paintbrush or the pencil, I wanted the microphone and the amplifier to, you know, push out my ideas. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I really, I really went, you know, completely uh, you know, head first into it. And at the time, every once in a while I would get, I'd have to get new musicians. Well, actually, let me, let me go back. I had the first lineup. So, yeah. so we were together for just about, I guess, just about two years until 1990. Hmm. And then they got upset and quit because I was taking things into my own hands because nobody else was. I was the one down at the club handing out flyers. I was right. the one making the flyers, booking the shows, writing the songs, um, uh, you know, planning rehearsals, uh, making stickers, T-shirts. I was doing it all, and they they did nothing. Let me and ask you a question, super quick. Interjecting, pause, pause button for one second. What the just so I fully understand. When you started the Empire Hideous, you know how like it's the same thing you see with like Marilyn Manson and Alice Cooper and stuff. Like, was the Empire Hideous initially a band, or was it your project and you brought in the musicians? And again, forgive me, I'm not a musician. I don't understand how these. Again, uh, every situation is different. If you could just elaborate a little bit on that. So, I um. Oh boy, this goes way back into like 1980, 
87. So, okay. So I okay. Was tw- I was 21 years old and I wanted to, I wanted to do music. And as right. I mentioned, I had, I had these health problems and I was in and out of the hospital and I really, I found, um, if you will, I found a, a desire to want to make music. So it was just me. And I was writing on this simple Casio keyboard back then. And I would basically record ideas onto a boom box. And back then you could actually hit record yeah. on a tape player back then and cool. record stuff. Now you can't mm-hmm. do that. So um, I used to, you know, put these ideas down. And then a friend of mine who I was friends with at the time, Don, uh, Don Ferratu, who was the guitar player. Don Ferratu. <laughs> right. And uh, his real name is Don Gulbovic. And uh, he oh. actually went yeah, he went on to do another band you might even know about, the Tombstones, uh, rockabilly band. Uh, that sounds familiar. Okay. Anywho, the point yeah. is, uh, at the time, Don was like 16 years old, still in high school. Wow. One day I went over him, like him and his cousin. We used to hang out, me and his cousin Rob. So uh, I went over the house. Don was there. Rob was there. We we're all smoking pot. You know, we we're having a good time. And um, I really want, like he was playing his guitar and I was like, damn, for a 16-year-old kid, you're pretty good. And I asked him, I said, listen, I got about 12 songs I want to write and I want to record at least six of them. I said, would you be interested in playing in a band with me? And he said, yes. So from that point, him and I worked together. It must have been at least close to a year. And at the time, I was I had just met Jerry Only and Doyle from the Misfits. So not only was that a big deal for me, but all my friends around me were making a big deal out of me because I was friends with Jerry only and Doyle. So eventually Don and I find these three other guys who were playing in a band and, and literally doing nothing but covers in their basement. So we approached them and I said, listen, here's the deal. You know, where I wrote music. Do you want to play it? I'm going to book some shows, make a recording. They said yes, and then we worked together for about, I guess, just about two years, maybe even a little bit longer until 19. In fact, our last show was at the Pipeline in March, I think it was March 19th, 1990, right after we played our first CBGB's gig, which was an audition night. And um, Was this the lineup with the Fly album? Is this the Fly album lineup? That's right. Got it. And so right after that, <clears throat> right after we played the last show, we had a meeting. And as I told you, all the stuff that I was doing to try to promote this band, mm-hmm. they they come to me and they're like, look, um, you've taken what was fun. Mind you, they're talking to me. And they said, you've taken what was fun and now you've now turned it into a job. I said, wait a minute. Do you guys want to be in a band? Do you want to be musicians? Because... I'm doing all the work. All you guys do is show up to play rehearsals and a, and a gig. I'm doing all the work. What's the problem? Uh, you you know, pay the boss to be the boss, man. Uh, so exactly. And so this this went on for years. You know, it was, wasn't just them because then they quit. I got a couple of new guys. That failed in like six months. Got a couple of new guys. That failed after about a year. Uh, and it was just over and over again. So by the time 1994 came around, we hooked up, I hooked up with uh, a guitar player named Mars, a bass player named Eve, uh, a guitar player named Jeff, who I'm still with today, and uh, a drummer at the time named Joey Quest. And we began to play, we, uh, we started getting gigs at, at, the, um, at the Pyramid in New York City. Oh, I know that then, place. Great, great club. At the bank. And, and I'll tell you, not to bank. brag or anything, but it really blew up for us. And by 1995... We were playing shows to like sold out clubs. I, I was I was amazed. I couldn't believe it myself how popular the band was getting. And it was only in New York because we could play in New Jersey to like 15 people. And then two nights from now, we'd play in New York to like 800 people. So go figure. Um, That's how it know, works, man. Markets, you know like just you, different you know, markets, you know. Well, you know what they say? A, a prophet is never heard in his own land. True. Very true. Very true. Right. So, yeah. um, so, okay. So it really is. I mean, it's one of those situations where the, the, you know, it starts off as like the empire hideous, but really it's you 
as kind of like, I guess maybe like it's a band, but it's also like a solo entity that is you. You surround yourself with musicians. And again, but but to, to go back to my initial question, so what happens when the when when you when you add and subtract members? What does that do for the dynamic and the chemistry? Does that change the sound? I can think of examples where the sound of the band changes because you're changing members and people play, people put different inflections on things. Like, tell me a little bit about that. What was that like? All right. So by 1991, yeah, uh, we we were looking. So before we got Jeff, before we got Jeff in the band as a second as a lead guitarist, um, it was just a a four piece band, only one guitarist. Okay. And I wanted a second guitarist because when I started the band, that, that dynamic of, of having stereo guitar really, it really made a difference for me. And there's so much more you can do. Uh, and plus it's just a wall of sound, you know, just right. really. You're filling things out live. Yeah. So by, by 1991, uh, maybe even by night. No, actually by night, it was still 1990. And um, we were looking for a guitar player. And so we uh, auditioned a couple of different people who came in and, and so many times the people would come in, a guitar player would come in and I would hand them like a tape of the two records that were out at the time, which was the 12 inch EP uh, self-titled and then the second EP, which was called This Evil on Earth. And um, each each one, you know, the first L EP had a, a five songs on it. The second one had three. And I would tell the people, you know, learn these songs. And then they'd come to a rehearsal or an audition. And then they would put in like leads and stuff like that. And I was like, what are you doing? No, that's not how I wrote the song. You play it like it was written. Yeah. And so many, So many people, a lot of guitar players wanted to change things by putting in their own style and and i can appreciate that yeah if you're starting out as a whole whole new group but if you've already mm -hmm. pre-written and established you should really sorry my cat's making noise behind me that's um, cool you should you should really kind of like go with what's been recorded and i had so many problems it was so difficult for me back then you know I, you, you know, know what's have, interesting? You, you know, know we, didn't, we didn't have the internet. We didn't yeah. have Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, or any of this shit that's out today. Right. We, I, I had to look for, for musicians by putting out classified ads in a magazine called the Aquarian Weekly or the East Coast. Heard Lock, of it. Yep. Right? Uh, I mean, that that's what I had to do to find and. and Oh my must, god! I, bands you must be into sounds like bands right. you must be into that. <laughs> I can't tell you. I, I would list bands. If you don't know these bands, don't right. call. And I would list like, you know, Christian Death, uh, TSOL, Fields of the Nephilim, The Misfits. Oh, we got to talk about um, those. All those, about all those bands from my early, like early style, Alien Sex Scene. And I would write, if you don't know these bands, don't call. And then I'd get a call from a guy. Like, are, are you a Christian band? Because I saw <laughs> I, What? <laughs> you know, it's funny. That's why, that's exactly why Glenn Danzig was looking for people when he was doing that's why he got that's why they ended up with Doyle eventually and stuff you know Glenn wanted to mold people he wanted to get people who were not super like experienced because he wanted them to just do what he wanted them to do in the band you know what i mean at least at the very beginning mm -hmm. and it's just interesting how you said that that's the first thing that thought that i thought of in my mind of just like of like, you know, the, I, I have an interview with a guy who's talking about like, yeah, you know, like if you're a really good, really, really good guitar player, you're going to have an opinion or some sort of authorship in what you are uh, doing. You might try to add your own flavor. And if someone is a mastermind with a vision that might go against said vision. Interesting, interesting notion.